Can we hear okay? Great, okay. Hello everybody, I've never, I have to say I've never worked in a room quite like this. This is peculiar. <laughs> and I don't, I, I'm sorry, I'm well aware of the fact that that pillar is going to be frustrating for you guys. So I'm going to... I'm gonna, <laughs> it's hard. Somebody is always reached out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move about a lot, which is gonna drive the, the camera guys crazy. Um, um, yeah, this is my team. Um, we started. Me and a friend started with one telephone and a desk back in 2004. A lesson for any of you out there who are students or trying to find your way in life: do something you care passionately about and put your time and effort into building up from that and I've never regretted ever working in the environmental field, and it's wonderful to be the founder of an organization because they can't really fire me, and it should be the <laughs> first job I've ever had that I haven't been fired from. But we have a, we have a, great, we have a great team, um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to throw straight head first into it. Um, I will say, though, a lot of our outputs, please have a look on our website. Um, and you will see a lot of what I'm drawing on here. We believe in evidence. We're not, I don't know, I, we do not know what works or what does not work in communicating climate change until we've tested it. A big mistake which has been made for so long now has been people thinking they know how to do it when actually they don't. Or they do something because they see somebody else doing it and they go, oh, that must work, and it doesn't. And a lot of what we've been doing is actually challenging that and saying, what you think works doesn't work. But we do the evidence on it. We write up the evidence, so we have a lot of reports. I'm going to quote some of these, but have a look on our website, join our newsletter, and, and so on. Uh, and this is a couple of books for Talking Climate by my colleagues, really pulls together this scientific research. And really saying climate change is a science, but communicating climate change is a science too. Mm. But we say this to scientists, you know. Uh, it's, it's based on evidence, it's based on research, it's based on experiments. And um, we can find out what works and what doesn't work. And we, that's what we do. And we do it academically and we do it campaigningly as well. Um, right, let's start. Let's start by. I want you to be doing a lot of talking on your tables. You're going to be. I will find a little thing to hit, probably this, which will be irritating, but it's got to make some kind of noise. Which will probably go. When you hear this little. Oh. Oh, oh! you want to stop when you hear that. I'll try and find something a bit nicer. Please um, stop talking, and we'll come back into the group, because a lot of what we're going to be doing this evening is going to be talk to the person next to you, come back, person next to you, come back. So that you're thinking and talking with each other all the time. There's no point talking about talking if you're not talking. It's just me talking. Um, let's start with other people talking. So this is very interesting. This was a... This, there isn't enough of this, by the way. It's something you might like to try in Sheffield, just going out into the streets and just asking people about climate change, just seeing what they think and say. Um, and my, my friends in a documentary company in uh, Ireland did this on the streets of Dublin. They went out, and it's called Barstool, the idea being that in Ireland people like talking in pubs, so they put out a barstool in the street, and they say, sit on the barstool and talk to us about climate change. I would like you to look at this, and then with the person next to you, Start exploring what you see when you see people talking about climate change. Now remember, these people didn't know that they were going to be talking about that until they were invited to sit on a bar stool. So they didn't really have a chance to prepare. So what we're seeing is something quite raw. We'll see the first things that come to mind when they're asked questions about climate change. What does that tell us about them? What does that tell us about the issue? What does it tell us about how we can communicate it, but also why it's so hard to communicate, OK? So let's, let's kick off. I think of this politics, and then after that, I think that probably I should think about it more. But there's so much going on that I don't really think about it all at The end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. But then there's a lot of people who say that it's not real and that it's just made up. The lobby to try and tell us that there is no climate change is very powerful, and. Uh, even though there's a lot of consensus, there's still some social media is saturated by people saying that it doesn't exist and they have a lot more money than the people who don't. There's too much you know you get in Memphis. It's as simple as that. You don't want to die greedy. Oh, you don't want to lose that money. There's no doubt that 97% uh, like of the evidence out there is supported by scientists that uh, you know this change is happening. I definitely think everyone in the world is going to be affected by climate change one way or another, whether they like it or not. Yeah. 
Okay, with the person next to you, what does that tell us about climate change? Just for just for one minute. Uh, <laughs> That's what it's going to be like for the next couple of hours. Just very quick in and out. Okay. <laughs> Throw up your hand if you have anything you'd like to share about what you're noticing in that. Don't be worried about the group. Everybody just throw in. Yes, please. Um, there's a lot of talk about... Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of talk about destruction to the environment with regards to the environment and with regards to other species that live in it, but not much discussion about the human impact. Or the impact on humans. Yeah. Yeah, well, and well, let's open that up. There was a lot of distancing language generally, right? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of language about it wasn't quite clear who was causing it. There was no discussion about the causes. There was no collection about our own involvement. Um, any other points on that, by the way? Distancing, yeah, please. Yeah, there was no urgency. There was no urgency? <coughs> well, yeah, there wasn't much of it. it didn't, you didn't feel the urgency. That's the point. I mean, remember, a large part of what we do when we see and listen to people is read their body language as well. We weren't seeing an urgent body language. But let's follow up also on that point. Um, people using the third person the whole way through, they would say, I think so, so there would be the I there, but they would never talk about this is how I feel. They would talk about the it. It moves very fast to be it, climate change, it's this problem, it's caused by this, da da da. Right? Other thoughts? Please. A, a lot of. Um uh, picking up on some of the images and sound bites that have been out of the media, that people got the paper, got the polar bears. I mean, it's part of distancing, but it's also echoing what have been put in some campaigns as such key images. Yes, yeah, people picking up on the images. So, what's interesting there is that, um, first of all, that those images are out there, but also that's why I said to you before we went in, remember, people haven't had a chance to think about this. So, they're just pulling down very quickly the things which are floating around in their head. So, that's why we're seeing these iconic things, um, and they're just, yeah. So what we're seeing there is we're not seeing fully fledged narratives. In fact, really what we're just seeing is little fractures, little memes, little, a bit of an image. And it's also interesting that people are thinking very much in terms of images, right? Um, nothing very full or complete. Not the narrative that, say, I as a climate change activist would have, or anything even vaguely like it. Um, other thoughts, please. There were two people who expressed their own feelings about it. One said, I don't really think about it, so there was that, that avoidance, and, yeah. and another person said everybody will die, or something. It's the end of the world. That's it. And so, so yeah. there were those sort of. Um, it's too awful to think about. That's yes. the implication. Or there was the. It's so awful when I do think about it. So there was that sense of. Yeah. So maybe I don't even think about it. I I like her honesty for saying that. Um, it didn't look to me like it was so awful she couldn't think about it. It looked like she had several steps before that point, where she just went, I, I'm not even going to think about it. Like she made a decision not to think about it before she even necessarily knew why she wouldn't, which is an interesting question. That one about it's the end of a world, I could see you kind of like reacting to that. It's curious, isn't it? It's, there's two instances in those videos where there's a reaction which is an ironic reaction. So it's the end of the world laugh. I mean, is the end of the world funny, or is it put forward as, I think what it is, is that she knows that on the one hand you can say it's on the other, end of the world, but on the other hand it feels weird or embarrassing to even say that. Like there's a tension in there. But the other thing which is interesting is where there's, where's the, there's the woman who says emissions, recycling, and she does that kind of little knowing which is that kind of thing. Like, She's making it clear that she is not the kind of earnest person who would belong that. There's an irony which is built in. Um, I'm, yeah, hi. Hello. So I felt as if a lot of people wouldn't normally talk about this, but they've been given license by having that bar still there. And yeah. so, um, because they wouldn't normally talk about it, probably because all those rich people have suppressed all the, uh, yeah. all the information, um, they're, they're now being able to say something about it, even if it own, is only on that level. It would be very interesting, wouldn't it, to be able to ask actually if they had ever talked about it. We'd have a pretty strong feeling some of the people in that never have, because they were clearly having problems thinking how they were going to talk about it. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things we know about opening up a conversation at a community level, for example, is that, which is something which I really hope that you will be working towards, is that people often feel hugely relieved to talk about it, and hugely relieved to find that they're not the only one who's concerned as well. So, like, if you ask people, are you concerned? 
interesting surveys, ask people, are you concerned, and then say, tell me what you think other people think. And people hugely underestimate the level of concern amongst people like themselves, unless they are in a kind of activist, green-oriented world. Particularly, for example, amongst conservatives. Conservatives are, the majority of conservatives are concerned about it, but when they're asked, do you think other people are concerned again? No, I don't really think so. Because they see no signs of it, because the conversation is suppressed, and in the absence of a conversation, how do you know what people think? I'm gonna push ahead if you don't mind. The point I really want to make, which is a really relevant one, is that the people's attitudes that we saw there were very strongly linked to their identity and who they were. So we could take pictures, screenshots of those people, and the scripts, jump them about on a table, and have a pretty confident guess about who said what, I would think. Like, you know, the, the, the kind of like more, you know, the more kind of down at heel guy who's saying it's all about the money, or the, or the kind of cool, the cool young guy who's saying, well, you know, yeah, it's a corruption, or the party goes as, you know, having a tan. I mean, we're kind of like, <coughs> I mean, I'm stereotyping, but we could kind of guess where people sit. Or the older guy who says, well, 97% of the evidence out there, and he actually gets it wrong, he gets it all muddled. I mean, what he says actually, when you look at it, doesn't make sense, it's wrong. But he's got the 97% because he's saying, I'm a very sensible person who looks at the evidence. He could also, it's then, he'd been a climate change denier. <laughs> he's saying, well, when you look at the evidence, it really goes to show that it's not such a serious problem. He could have said that as well. So, but we know, I think the important thing that we know about climate change is, and we can see in that video, is that people construct a narrative, images, we heard that, stories, but validate who they are, what their values are and their identity. So the story that people hold around climate change is the story that they wish to tell the world about who they are and what they are and how they see things. And that's really the lesson of what we're going to talk about, how to communicate climate change. If it doesn't exist in terms of people's own values and identity, they drop it. So if I give people a storyline which is just based on my values and they don't share those values, they just say, I'm not interested, and they drop it. And this is exactly what we will see has been happening with political polarization. Um, so I'm going to outline a number of principles. You will notice as we go through the principles that the numbering is completely arbitrary, but they, the numbers mysteriously jump around because I've reshuffled all the slides, and to be honest, I couldn't be bothered to renumber them all. But they're basically a set of principles. Um, incidentally, I'm happy to share this slide pack as well. So if you like, and you drop me a line, or maybe you know you can drop the organizer's line and we can put it up. I don't want to put it up on the website particularly, but um, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, right. Values up, not numbers down, right? The first thing, this is really, really important. So much of climate change is based on facts and figures. That is fundamental. It is fundamentally a scientific issue based on something. We should never take that away, that's very important. However, whilst that builds our understanding, it does not significantly shift people's views or commitment. It is entirely possible for people to know the facts and figures and yet be amazingly lukewarm about the issue. <laughs> I have to say, I know some climate scientists in that category too. Not, we've had Kevin Anderson speak to you, he's one of a few who really understands it and cares passionately. But some actually, they almost have an emotional distancing where they go, well, that's my day job and now I'm off to fly somewhere and, and, and have a nice holiday, I deserve it. Um, <laughs> facts and figures really shift views. What happens is that people's views are actually shaped by these stories based on their values and their identity about who they are. And then what happens is then they find the information to support that story that they've already shaped. Now, this is basic cognitive psychology. So this is science, actually. In fact, one of the things I like to do with scientists, when we do work with scientists who communicate climate change, is we say, there is a science to communicating it, and here is the science. The science says that facts and figures don't very, go, work very well in persuading people, shifting people. And I said the ultimate proof of that is that we have been telling you, scientists, this for 20 years, and you don't pay any attention. <laughs> in other words, you don't pay attention to the evidence for what you're doing doesn't work very well, because you are invested in an identity which is about promoting graphs to people. <laughs> okay, so we can turn the whole thing around. What happens if people find the facts to fit? So we have a perfect example of this in Brexit with a Brexit battle bus. Now, we're not going to say anything about where we sit on this. We recognize, incidentally, this is a very interesting polarized issue like climate change, where actually we're going to have to find some togetherness on it. But what is interesting here is that the narrative is based around values and identity. Let's take back control, okay? 
That's the storyline that got large numbers of people to vote for leaving the European Union. Then it finds the information to fit. The sloganeering was based on information. So David Cameron running a high level, expert driven, information driven campaign saying, here's the expert saying this, here's the head of the IMF saying this, here's the, right, trying to do this information data driven argument. We can argue about whether it's true or not, but that's the strategy, didn't work. The strategy what worked was values driven, which found the information to fit, even when, <coughs> actually, to be honest, it doesn't fit very well at all. Um, we need to go into it. So, this is how people think. And clever people do this cleverly. That's important to stress, right? So I have spent a lot of time talking with people who deny the climate science. They are all thoughtful, intelligent, well-educated people, right? And we have to say, I'm glad that they're thinking about it, which is a good few steps up above most people. However, what they do is they apply their intelligence and their education to collecting the information to fit the position they already have. Clever people do clever bias, basically. So a lot of what we're going to do is we have to find the arguments and the language which fits for people and who they are. Lesson two. We can learn from all kinds of campaigns. So I'm very interested, for example, in food campaigns, in diet campaigns, in seatbelt campaigns, in smoking campaigns. I'm interested also in looking at myself, like why is it despite smoking campaigns that I was smoking in Bonn? Well, it was because I told myself I couldn't possibly get the work done unless I smoked, which is a storyline I'm telling myself in order to justify my addiction. Because I'm I'm clever, so I'm putting lots of words into it actually to create a story around what is actually basically uh, a cognitive bias on my part. So we can learn. So have a look at this and see what you think of this, and then I'll take your views. There's something in these pictures you can't see. It's essential to life. We breathe it out. Plants breathe it in. It comes from animal life. The oceans, the earth, and the fuels we find in it. It's called carbon dioxide, CO2. The fuels that produce CO2 have freed us from a world of backbreaking labor. Lighting up our lives, allowing us to create and move the things we need, the people we love. Now some politicians want to label carbon dioxide a pollutant. Imagine if they succeed. What would our lives be like then? Carbon dioxide. They call it pollution. We call it life. Okay. Fellow communicators, what do we learn from that masterful piece of communication? <laughs> <laughs> Huh? They, they didn't use any statistics about climate change, but they were using facts. Yeah, they were using little factoids. Well, they were using they were using they were using stories, right? Yeah. They were using stories. They were using stories about, about about human progress. You know, about where we've gone, about about how we nurture and care for the people we love. And it's not just a car; it transports and moves the people we love. Spot on. Other thoughts on that? Please. <laughs> It was a very soft-spoken, caring, compassionate kind of voice that was used to kind of suck you into yes. that way. Yes, it was. Yes, it, yeah. was a, it, was a, it was a nice voice. It was interesting. You don't quite understand what's going on until no. you get into it. Yeah. yeah. Other thoughts? Please. The stories are quite emotive, so it's about what yeah. you love and the thing you love to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it definitely it spoke to the emotions. It, it did, I have to say, it did all of the things good communications does, which is why I show it every time I talk about communications. And why I met the guy, when I was writing my book, I went and met the guys who made it in the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And we had a very peculiar afternoon together. <laughs> <laughs> Where I said, tell me about how you do such good communications. <laughs> that, that seemed to be a good way of starting a conversation rather than banging their heads against the wall. Um, <laughs> other, other views, please. Um, it, it, it does say that carbon dioxide is a pollutant, but, but it doesn't make it clear that all <coughs> systems have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and natural systems recycle that, absolutely. But humans 
you know, are affected negatively by carbon dioxide, and they they don't make that that clear. That you know, I'd love to see one of those with their head in a bag, um, breathing carbon dioxide, and, and, and then making the line, you know. Well, it's a lie. I mean, the whole thing is a lie. It's a lie writ large in the interest of blocking the legislation that was very important strategically in the US because if they declared carbon dioxide a pollutant, it came within the remit of the president in order to put pollution controls on power plants. And so it's strategically very important. And ideologically, these people are opposed to that market intervention because they don't believe in climate change. Um, yes, please. Says that it's politicians who think that CO2 is a pollutant. It doesn't mention scientists. It doesn't mention no. any of that. No, but it creates a narrative where people are trying to stop us from developing, and it brings pollution. Politicians into the frame. They did another. They did another advert as well when it talks about environmentalists as well, right? So it has a narrative that they are stopping you from having the things you have a right to have, and the story of human progress. But we don't need to dwell on it. I'm just saying we can learn things from the people we disagree with. And if you want to have a look on YouTube, there's a video of me doing a TEDx of specifically this theme, how we can learn from the people we don't know or don't even like. Uh, I just want to say, George, it reminded me of there's a, a Lloyd's Bank advert that's been in the cinemas recently. Right. And it's got all these children looking out of windows and people hugging each other and grandparents yeah. and whatever. And then you realise it's, it's a black horse going by. And you realise it's all about this, this bank. And, and it feels to me like the world of advertising, this is powerful, but the, the, those messages, those emotional appeals have been debased by the context in which they're placed. You know, it's such a good point. We, we, we have a constant, uh, we have a constant, it's so funny, I don't quite understand. We have a, <laughs> we have a constant um, kind of armament battle with commercial advertising who takes stuff with good communications and then cheapen it by making it commercial. So I will say to you, yes, please build on values and identity, but don't think that is happening in isolation because all these other people with big advertising budgets are doing the same thing and they're debasing the currency. We will make the point later on that authenticity is key, is key, and Lloyds Bank doesn't have authenticity. But it's right, I went into my local Lloyds Bank and they'd renamed all of their leaflets, so now insurance was called snug. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not kidding. And you know, and or, or like, or care, or hug, or like, and they had pictures of kids and grandparents and so on. Like, it's not about the filthy money; it's about the love. And superficially, it works. Of course, it doesn't work for Lloyd's Bank because that is not the way we want the bank to talk to us. Well, who knows? Maybe it does. But you're right. There, there, there's an arms race. So everything we say, we have to always add endless caveats about, like, well. I'll come back to a point. So, um, right, climate change is difficult, right? No one really wants to believe in it. And it's very easy to ignore and very easy to push away. Um, this is from Yale University. I think this is the only graph I show. Um, it's interesting here um, asking people who will be harmed by global warming. Just look at this, like, they're all the same. Look at this one here. Uh, a great deal. I personally, only 10% of Americans think they'll be affected a great deal. But there's an optimistic people in that group who think that their family will be more affected than them. <laughs> and their community more so, people in the US more so, people in other industrialized nations more so, developing countries more so, future generations, big jump, and then other species, right? So at each level of remove, people think it will be more harmful. <laughs> and this is a distancing. It's a two-way distancing. On the one hand, people think that's their perception, and to some extent it's true, people in developing countries will be harmed more than us. But on the other hand, it's a narrative based on distance. So people will accept that climate change is a huge threat for future generations, and they're more likely to accept that than accept it's a threat. In other words, people adopt narratives of distance. That's why, and I'll just come to that point in a second, that's why we need to be very careful of all images which say this is going to be, this is what's going to happen in 2100, this is how it's going to affect people in other countries, um, and so on. Not because that stuff isn't important and motivating, we must talk about it, we must be aware every time we promote those stories, that if we do so without talking how, about how it would affect us or how it's important to us now, we are creating a distance narrative. <laughs> And lots of people, including my friends in the environmental movement and scientists, are very happy to have a distance narrative because it means they don't have to accept it. We've been doing that for 20 years, so an 25 years. An entire generation has gone past, 
And we are now in the future that we were talking about 25 years ago, and people still are just as likely to think it's a future issue as they were 25 years ago. So clearly what's happening is it's always slightly over the horizon. Another reason why it's hard to accept climate change is it doesn't have enemies. I mean, you know, think about if those people on the streets of Dublin had been asked, what do you think about terrorism? There wouldn't be any irony, there wouldn't be any laughter, it would be an immediate, strong, visceral, emotional response because there's an enemy there who intends to cause harm. But climate change is much harder because we are all, as that, as that carbon dioxide advert showed, we are all in various ways involved and engaged in this. And I think we have to find a story uh, for me, it's a constant argument and debate, and an important one to have with the environmental movement, which I've been in all my working life, about whether oil companies make good enemies or not. I don't think they do, is my view. I don't think climate change works well with enemy narratives. I think we need to find narratives of collective purpose, not, not blame. Not to say, however, that oil companies aren't fully, fully mendacious and responsible in many, many ways. But just to think we are just going to say, we need to stop climate change because it's been forced on us by oil companies, doesn't fit the facts in my view. But <coughs> you can ask me questions online about that. This advert is interesting. Um, or this cartoon here. Here's Hillary Clinton. This was a few years ago when she was just about to run. Climate change is the most consequential, urgent, sweeping challenges we face as a nation in the world. I wouldn't disagree. Here's the figure of ISIS. You are prepared to cut off people's heads saying, talk about it, deny it. So the problem we have is that climate change does not have a compelling enemy narrative in the way that ISIS does. But when you make claims about how deadly serious it is, it's like the end of the world, you find a little laugh coming because it's kind of almost, does that, is that really true? I have this problem too. So I think that's why we need to recognize that really, the language which moves and motivates people is going to be about belonging and about sharing things. The things we share, the identity we share, for joy of being a part of something. And the more work I do on this, the more I'm convinced that this is the place we need to look. So this is a big part of what I'm gonna be sharing with you. Now, recognizing also that we all here in this room share things, but also we don't share things, but people within their own groups. We have, we have multiple identities. Yeah? We have multiple identities based on, based on our age, on our politics, where we come from, what we care about, maybe we have different faiths, maybe we have all kinds of different backgrounds, we have people I can see in this room from all around different places in the world. So we don't all have to have one identity, but ultimately we need to be speaking to various identities. And that's what makes huge marches such fun. This was the, the one in New York. I, I was there because I was promoting my book. It was wonderful, 400,000 people on the streets of New York, brilliant the joy of belonging, and I belong to that. In fact, I was right there, weirdly right there I, I, at the front, and I found myself next to my old boss, Sting. That's a whole other thing of how I came to work for Sting. But I, I'm, there in this, I'm there in this kind of group of people, and they are all like me, and I think this is great. We have to ask a serious question about the joy of belonging, though, which is, <laughs> Was everybody belonging on this march? I don't think so. I think half the population of America was being very actively repelled. Mm -hmm. and that is another issue we need to say. The joy of belonging has to make people feel that they belong. And if you're running a march which tries to pull people together, you want people marching with a banner saying, Texan Republicans demand action on climate change. You, you want them there. Because otherwise, it's, it's just one side which is devastating in the States. I'm going to come back to this point. I think it's basic human rights. I think actually everyone has a right to know about climate change, and the vast majority of people don't. And they have a right to understand it in their own terms, their own language. And I want to introduce this idea of rights, basic rights. So, we're going to keep coming back to this. Strong communications say this. This is who you are, right? You, whoever I'm talking to, you. The communications reflects to them what they are and validates it. What you are is great. This is what you care about, and you're quite right to care about that because those things are important. And look, there are other people around you who are just like you in your group who agree with this. These last two are really, really important. 
When you take the action, when you think about climate change, your reward is you become more who you think you are, and the world becomes more how you want it to be. Right? So your reward for action isn't saving the polar bears, it isn't, um, uh, you know, it isn't saving the planet, it, it isn't reducing emissions. Oh heavens, like carbon footprint, you know, we need to reduce our emissions. Why? What's the reward for me in reducing my emissions? The reward for me is because I'm the kind of person who cares about my emissions, and therefore, the reward is being who I am, and that's me. But for other people, it's going to be something different. You know? So we do a lot of work with people of faith, so, so what, why would somebody of Islamic faith say we should take action on climate change? Because it's something which is a very Islamic thing to do. <laughs> because it's there in the Quran. You know, because the prophet, peace be upon him, says in the Quran, says we should care for the earth. And therefore doing that is something which is a very Islamic thing to do, which brings you closer to Allah, which brings you closer to the sense of who you are. For any group, for conservatives, same thing. For people of the left, it's about social justice. For <coughs> it's about solidarity, working together. It makes you who you are, and the world moves with you. So we'll come back to this equation again and again. But we work with a lot of different organizations, and the reward is always has to be along these lines. With me so far? I'm talking fast because I have two hours instead of three, so I simply talk 30% faster. <laughs> is that the right proportion? I've got mathematicians in the room who can tell you that. Right. So, what I'd like you to do, please. Ah, you've got quite a lot of people on your table. So I think groups of two or three, whatever works out. I would like you, for the next 20 minutes, I would like you to be somebody, right? Think of kind of somebody you might like to be. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a massive mashup focus group where you're all going to be different people. Right? We're not going to hear from all of you by any means. I'm going to pull out a few views and hear what you think of different climate messages. But I'm going to ask you to think your way inside someone else's skin. So um, here are just some ideas. but. You be whoever you want to be. You know, you might want to be Auntie Elsie, or you might want to be the postman, or you might want to be your head of department, or anything you want. So I just put a few up there, just in case, like you know, you're, you're struggling for ideas. I don't mind, incidentally, if we have a few environmental activists in the room, because if you're all environmental activists, that's a shame. It'd be nice to have a few of you left, right? So, could you do that? So, what I'd like you to do is. Very quickly, you've got one minute to find a group of two or three people and decide who you want to be. I want you, so if you are all the same person, you can compare notes on what you are, and if you're all different people, you can still do this, because I want to know where you went on a holiday, and I want you to just tell me what your three core values are, okay? You've just got one minute to quickly think inside the skin of what do you think, if I was to ask you, what's really, okay, core values sounds technical, so if I was to say to you, okay, what's really important to you in your life? Think inside the skin of the person who you are, and try and get the answer from where you went on holiday, just one minute. Tell you what.
What you Very quick. Hands up, anybody. Tell me where you went on holiday and what your values are and who you are. Let's get a sense. Okay. Yes, please. So I'm a 30-year-old yeah. boy and I'm still dreaming of going to Ibiza, but my mum didn't let me go. And <laughs> I really care about being cool. I really care about having friends and also I want to be really individual and not be like my parents at all. Oh, that's brilliant. That's just what I'm looking for. <laughs> so you're really thinking yourself in terms of who you are. That's great. And the reason I asked where, where did you go on holiday, it's just one of the things which makes people different. It's real marker of people's identity. So that's really important. Yeah. 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 Ye
for a young mum would be exactly the person who might be concerned by with messages about children. But you're telling me that as a young mum you're not? No. Because it's too many responsibilities, so it's like I'm saying you have another one. Okay, um, please. Well, uh, we're, we're Lord Lawson, and although <laughs> one, of our, Congratulations. one of our core values is, is about family values. But so, but because we don't believe the the, the science, um, then we we would not agree with that statement. Because although we care about our children and the future of them, reducing emissions doesn't have any relevance to that. So, oh, so Nigel, if I can, shall I call him Nigella? <laughs> Lord, did you like any of them? Sorry, the the first two certainly didn't. Okay, interesting. Okay, that's very interesting. Okay, uh, let's have another slide. Please. I'm this retired head teacher, and yeah. um, don't like it because it's not reduced emissions. We're intelligent, we read the paper, and it's, it's not true. It's just a cycle. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, you're skeptical. Okay. So, already we're seeing in the group that things come up, things work better for some people, not for others. So, I had a question already online. Who sent me the question online about future generations? Exactly. About children? Can you tell us for a question? Can you remember? Um, I think so. Um, so my question was about um, a lot of campaigners and public figures talk about the family when they talk about climate change. So think of your children like I would think of mine. You know, yeah. Prince that, that sort of thing, we can make a better world for our children. And I, I wasn't sure that that was really the... I was asking whether that's the right way to think mm. about it because it seems that... It's, if I don't have kids, you know, if it was my kids, I'm not really sure it's going to affect them anyway. Or if you're thinking about the family, you start thinking about, I think, private good rather than public good. And yeah. climate change is a big abstract messy thing. I think these are all very good questions to ask. <coughs> we don't know. We simply don't know how well it works or not. But the one thing I can tell you is it's a gamble. There is no rule that says that talking about children works. Mm. Right? Future generations, first of all, that language pushes it firmly in the future. Mm. Right? Okay. Mm. Talking about our children's future starts to bring the future into play. Where people go, oh, that's awful for the future, even when it's their children's future. As we know, people don't think it's their kids that will be affected, it's someone else's kids. Mm. That's the truth of it. Um, what's interesting is statistically, if you ask people how much you care about climate change, Within the same age group, the same class, the same everything else we might look at, people with children are less concerned than people without. So the act of having children hasn't shifted their views any. That in itself, I think, is revealing. The problem is, once we... So I think what happens is I think this is one of these things where, where people who are concerned about climate change bring in the information to support that story. So for me personally, I'm very concerned about the future of my children, I'll tell you so, right? That doesn't mean, however, that going out and telling people you're concerned about the future of your children works. In fact, some people may very well give you very strong pushback and feel manipulated, or we'll see a good yes. example of that in a moment. Mm -hmm. So who is telling you that it's important about the children is very, very important. Do you trust somebody saying, the children is important to me? Do you trust that storyline? <coughs> the CEO of Barclays Bank, there he is, John Varley, Interesting, he didn't say I take action on climate change to make money. He came up with this very, this was the storyline he came up with, right? And as Barclays Bank, he did some good stuff on climate change. He did some not so good stuff on climate change. Do we, do we feel more inclined to take action on climate change when we see him saying that yes or no? I don't know, I, hands up anybody who's, ah, now do this as your people, by the way. Maybe not as you. So anybody here who thinks as the person they are that that might move them? We have a bank manager. Yeah. Sorry. Please. Yeah. Who are you? Bank manager. Ah, okay. A different bank, but a bank manager. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm very skeptical about climate change and don't see it relevant, but he's a good guy. Okay. So that's interesting. So again, we're coming back to this very critical thing about, about how we, whether we trust communicators or not is whether or not they seem to speak to us and our values. Yeah. I'm a trade unionist in the steel industry, and that, that just makes me really hate that number one uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. point. You know, it's yeah. like I always thought it was just people like him like, putting this message across. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we could. We could. You, you know. Okay. Yes, please. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, no. I'm the no, uh, math teacher. Yeah. Um, and 
uh, unfortunately, just looking at him makes my blood boil. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard a similar message uh, come from David Attenborough. I love David Attenborough, and I'm much more inclined to the same message. Different so, so we're hearing very clearly through this, I'm sure it's true. As I said there, the authenticity of a person giving us this message is critically important. If we like them, if we trust them, if they seem to be authentic, then we're likely to say that that's a powerful message that we might take on board. If we distrust them, it feels manipulative. We can learn a lot from that. So children, answer to your question. Tricky, but I have to say completely untested. No one has ever tested children's narratives. A lot of people assume it works, but it works for them. That's your first warning sign. If something seems to really work for you, you've got to be wary as to whether it works for people who are not <coughs> like you. Right. Um, this future generations thing, we have to make climate change here and now. We have to be very wary of projecting into the future. Right. Climate change is already a disaster getting worse. Um, who, uh, who liked this or who felt this was a message that might work for them? Really? Uh -huh. cool. do, do we have any environmentalists in the room? Yeah, yeah you see, you've done that thing, you've all become someone else, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe like, dislike is too, is too strong, but if you were to shed your, your current garb and to be the person you really are, would that message work for you or not? Yeah, yeah okay, we're seeing a bit more. Yeah, I mean, it would work for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, doom and gloom works for people who are motivated on this issue. We have to be careful, as we know. Yeah, the fact that none of you put your hands up shows that you all know for wider public that this is a problem. That, that actually, we know, and this is well tested. Yeah, please. But, um, as a trade unionist, um, I, I wouldn't go for that message. But if I've met um, Philippine trade unionists, I, I might start to change my mind. I think on that. that okay. You know, it's like I might be more believe. That story that climate change is already a disaster. Okay, yeah. Okay, so again, we've got, yeah. Um, as a small shopkeeper um, from, with family in Pakistan, um, I know there have been terrible Both examples we're hearing because there's a personal connection and therefore there's a degree of trust based on the communicator and you trust the communicator who's telling you. Mm -hmm. Interestingly though, some research working from people from minority groups <coughs> say it's not cut and dried. So I have friends who were working with Bangladeshi community on climate change in Birmingham and they said actually messages about climate change impacts in Bangladesh didn't always work with them, but there were some people there who said, yeah, that's terrible, Bangladesh has always had floods, what a nightmare. And effectively, they were saying, I'm British now, and I'm so glad I'm not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was almost, I don't mean that in a bad way, it's almost like people's identity had shifted to a point where actually bad news about Bangladesh was almost a reassertion of their non-Bangladeshi identity. So this stuff is complex, but you're absolutely right. So the, the problem with this is we do need to tell people it's bad news, but we have to find a way of doing it. Oh, there's a polar bear. I have it in for polar bears. You've already, you've already sensed this. Um, we have an outfit called Climate Visuals, which is a program which goes and measures visual images. First time ever. No one's ever tested before. And do have a look. Just look it up. Um, and it's very successful. We've now got some of the biggest photo agencies in the world now on board taking our advice about what they put out. And I have to say, polar bears for me are a little bit key because in focus groups, we just find out they just don't work very well. They're trite, they're cliched, and they're everywhere. And so, and part of the problem, as we know, is that there are a, a distancing quality for the bad news. Oh, I've already shown that slide. <laughs> Interject yeah. really quickly with this. I know this guy who works on communications at Greenpeace, and I chatted to him a couple of years sure. ago about, and he said, when they put up a picture of like a sad polar bear on their social media accounts, yeah, yeah. they get like a boatload yeah. of likes. Right. When they try to post something about the uh, the refugee crisis yeah. and, and human rights and link it to climate change, and um, they got like a boatload of abuse um, on their social media channels. So like a lot of people ask, I, I don't think I don't like yeah. it myself, but a lot of people ask the liking of people the polar bears, and they really struggle yeah. with that. Yeah, it's very true, man. But I I hear this a lot, and. The reason is that people who love polar bears are very concerned about polar bears. 
and the, and, and the, and the Greenpeace net is going to have a very disproportionately large number of polar bear people caught in it. However, even for people who love polar bears, I would still argue it is a problematic image because it is a distancing image. But yes, it is true, and this is one of the reasons. The part of the problem also is environmental organisations have held this message so strongly on climate change and have shaped it in their own image. And I worked for Greenpeace for years, so I, I love the organisation. But I also understand how it works. It works in terms of promoting its own narrow interests. It's a niche organ operator, and it gets in there by pushing very hard on its interests. It was therefore pushing on the Arctic campaign, and it put all exploration in the Arctic, the preservation of the Arctic and Antarctica, and climate change all in one box. And it found it worked very well, but unfortunately too well, too strongly identified with that one issue. But yeah, I'm sure Greenpeace works well. Let's have a look at some bad news. I'd, I'd like you to have a look at this. <coughs> This was the last attempt that the British government ever made to communicate with the public on climate change. <laughs> Which is sad. This goes back ten to the days. Ago. Ten years ago? It was ten years ago. Uh, and who was Minister for Climate Change who commissioned us? Ed Miliband. A very, very committed and honourable man who really cared about the issue. So they said, let's engage with people, let's have a public engagement campaign called Act on CO2. And this was the advert that they put out. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at this and then to think as the person you are, not the person you came as, the person you currently are, what do you think of this? Now we'll notice it's talking about how it's bad and will affect your children. So it's already playing with things which they believed would work well. Just have a look at this and then for one minute afterwards consider what works or does not work for you in this. Oh, I should add, hang on, let me set the context. This went out in the advertising break halfway through Coronation Street. Hey. So you are very likely to be sitting there, possibly with your family, possibly, who knows, you just imagine the situation of who's watching this. I do watch it. There was once a land where the weather was very, very strange. <coughs> there were awful heat waves in some parts, and in others, terrible storms and floods. Scientists said it was being caused by too much CO2, which went up into the sky when the grown-ups used energy. They said the CO2 was getting dangerous. Its effects were happening faster than they had thought. Some places could even disappear under the sea, and it was the children of the land who'd have to live with the horrible consequences. The grown-ups realized they had to do something. They discovered that over 40% of the CO2 was coming from ordinary everyday things like keeping houses warm and driving cars, which meant if they made less CO2, maybe they could save the land for the children. Is my happy ending? It's up to us how the story ends. See what you can do. Search online for Act on CO2. Okay, one minute with the people next to you. What do you think of the story? Okay, everybody. I wish I could give you longer. I can't, I'm afraid. Um, thoughts on that? Hands up, anybody. What did you think of that? What can we learn from it? Um, I thought it was pretty bleak. Um, am I speaking as me or as my person? Mm, you speak as your person. Um, I thought it was pretty bleak. And um, if I had kids, then I think they'd be a little bit scared by it. And mm. I also felt like, well, if the government thinks it's so important to put on TV, why aren't they doing more about it? Why are they shifting all the blame to me as an individual? All very good points. Um, I'm a bricklayer and I, I haven't got kids, but I, I thought it was a bit scary. I, thought, I don't see the point in telling stories like that. And what's wrong with Thomas the Tank Engine anyway? <laughs> <laughs> there's something, there's something yeah, there about the taking the context of that being something where you're reading a story to a kid which feels a little disturbing. I it's, yeah. it's interesting, yeah, sure. actually. I, I showed this when I was doing a lot of trades union work. I showed this a lot of mail sorters from the CWU because we were doing engagement with them. And their immediate reaction was it was a kind of child abuse. They were saying, like, what kind of sick parent reads stories like that? <laughs> and as that kind of sick parent, that hadn't occurred to me before. But, it, but I didn't realize that. I'd, I'd never done that actually with my kids, and I had protected them. So, yeah, no, there is something there which is a little unbalanced. I don't know, other things, please. Uh, as well as those, we felt that if it's not a sketch, that 
it would feel like indoctrination of children, you know, we were telling them scary things that were wrong. Um, yeah, it does feel like indoctrination. The whole way it's dressed up is fundamentally feels like propaganda, yeah. actually, mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, please. Um, I think uh, I feel as though it's, um, it's like treating me as the child, and um, it feels very like it's sort of like it's speaking down to me as a sort of unintelligent person. It is, well, it's, it's problematic in so many ways. You're, you're right, it pitches it at a fairy tale level which is condescending towards the audience, but also is condescending towards the science too. It's like it takes an issue that Lord Lawson is already trying to actively undermine. It says, oh, that thing you're trying to undermine? Hey, it's like a children's fantasy story. So it's really not doing any honesty to the science. Please. As a UKIP supporter, um, I, I thought the, the people in it um, would probably have my values, but I thought it was patronising, which was pretty much what the other guy said. And as, as me, I think making it fiction is a real issue because you're making it into fiction and it's reality. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all very, very good points. So the big lesson that we can learn is, sorry, I, I am actually now just going to brutally charge ahead to get this covered. The, the, the real lesson we can take from this as communicators is that this was not tested. Yeah. You, you as individuals, as a group, as imagining yourself in the shoes of people, immediately start spotting problems with that. It was the worst kind of testing, which is testing in front of the entire country during peak viewing season. <laughs> Not how to test your messages, and it was a disaster, and it got pulled immediately because Advertising Standards Authority had a record number of complaints. Many of which were motivated by fundamental climate scepticism, but hey, communications which gets people's, the skeptics backs up doesn't work either, mm. right? But also from people who genuinely were like, they felt that their kid had been really shocked by it, that it was disturbing, but it didn't, it's awful. And um, it's also awful in the details, by the way, like act on CO2, what's this CO2? You know, grown-ups found that 40% of a CO2, what, what is this, 40% of a CO2, it's ridiculous. Um, and the government has never done anything since, even vaguely like it. Uh, and that's a tragedy too. Um, so let's move on. Let's learn. Negative information has to sit there, but I think it has to be in a narrative arc. So we have to say, yes, there's problems. Yes, we're not going to lie to you. We're not going to condescend to you. This is serious. But if we pull together, if, if we pull together, if we do these things, we can have a resolution on this where we can actually have some positive aspects as well. So it's hard to get this balance, and, and there's a lot of debate about how much. And also, sometimes it's useful to have some people saying, saying, actually, it's the end of the world, and having that argument out there. It needs to be out there, but not in your public engagement. Right, number four. This other is the other extreme. Uh, exciting changes and many new opportunities for a low-carbon future. Um, I'm going to ask you what you think about it. Here, here's a little video that shows it. In 2012, partners from all walks of life have come together to build a sustainable future. We call it Sustainia. Sustainia is a realistic vision of the world in 2020. Wow. It's based on the best available know-how in science. It's a construction site for those who have the solutions, technology, and ideas to build a sustainable tomorrow. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's just to warm you up. Exciting changes in the opportunities in low-carbon future. Who liked that? Oh, good. Okay, you, you really liked it. Who, who are you? I'm a green businessman who's selling the dream. Oh. <laughs> that, that's my future. That's, that is the truth. Get used to it. <laughs> I like that. And, and, and also, people, people who like you right now, people who are are projecting that narrative are in some ways much more appealing to be around than the people who are going, 
oh, we're all going to die, <laughs> you know? And that is important. So in other words, there's something, there's a whole campaign right now called Climate Optimism, saying let's spread the good news. And certainly done by some of the same people who advised on that um, thing there. So good, we've got that. Um, so we're learning a little bit, please. Yeah. Um, you liked it? Yes, I liked it. Um, who are you? Uh, we are um, an um, executive of a Sheffield Steel company, okay. which uh, one executive as it happens, um, built from scratch. And we supply steel components into the energy industry. Yeah. Okay. And we are looking to uh, hook our steelworks up to um, renewable energy, which is produced next door on site, uh, so that we can get cheaper energy, sell cheaper products, and sell our products as produced with renew renewable energy. Excellent. So you're doing the practical tools for moving forward. So it's like exciting changes, opportunities. You like the word opportunity, don't you? It's a good business word. Um, but it's not going to stop us going to Barbados for our holidays in Turkey. <laughs> well, but then again, in your, in your narrative, it doesn't have to because you're already doing a great deal through your work. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't like it? Hands up, anybody who doesn't like it? Please. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, a newly retired lady who travels a lot to visit her family. Um, I'm very fond of my family. I'm very fond of people. I don't like three because it's impersonal. Then not me, or we, or us. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like you, clearly. It doesn't feel like you. Other people who didn't like it. Um, yeah, I'm trying to find people I haven't heard much from yet. Mm, anybody who hasn't spoken okay. yet? Okay. It's hard, oh, hello, I'm so sorry. It's a nightmare in this room. I'm gonna move here to the middle, but I'm just gonna pirouette. Yeah. Um, well, um, I'm a UKIP supporter, but um, I might be talking about me. I just thought it was really creepy. Yes. Um, <laughs> why? It was almost like the beginning of a, of a horror. <laughs> 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 I really didn't like it. There was something very con um, controlled about it. Are we talking about the film or are we talking about the, the exciting... Film. Oh, that one. Oh, yeah. the, the exciting changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, no it is, it's disturbing, isn't it? Well I'm just wondering if there's anybody here who's on lower incomes. We, we already have, we already have, yeah, please. Uh, so I'm a teenage Dartmouth student. Oh yeah. Uh, North Sheffield, and I, I, I don't know what the hell it's on about, to be honest. What's the low health and future? Like, hmm. we, have low, we have a teenage mum as well, yeah, don't we? Teenage mum, um, I, I, it, no, it doesn't relate to any of my life experience. I think yeah. that that's completely, you know, it, it's it's, some, it's a future that I'm very unlikely to have anything to do with. You know, I'm struggling, you know, am I going to get my child to a decent school? That's yeah. what I'm thinking about, you know, let alone, you know, being able to walk down one of those impersonal places. I want sort of something cuddly. I want sort of a place where I feel comfortable. I didn't feel comfortable in that sort of environment. It wouldn't be appealed to me at all. No, I also think I think it's fair to say that exciting changes and opportunities. These are this is basically an elite narrative. It's one which I'm, I've got some feedback. Here. It's one which works for people who already feel powerful and therefore feel in a position like that. Still, make and the other people we hear from for taking up new opportunities, but many people are just struggling simply to cover their bills. Mm -hmm. We know we tested this narrative amongst others right across Wales when we did a big piece of research for Welsh government, and the Welsh government loved this narrative. Like governments like elite narratives because they are run by elite <coughs> politicians and they think in this way. However, they forget the fact that other people don't feel the same way, and actually, it bombed. You can imagine. I mean, people just say, well, I, I can't even afford a car now, so why are you telling me about battery-powered cars, and why are you telling me about solar panels when I can't pay the rent? Mm -hmm. So, again, we're finding with all of these messages, some of them work, some of them don't work, and so on, but uh, they work differently for different audiences. So many ways for us to do our bit, use less energy. Um, who liked that? Hands up. Yep. Why did you like that? Uh, we're we're uh, single mother. Okay. And we thought this saved money. Okay. Okay. Um, retired, um, recently retired uh, lady um, who very keen on loving and supporting her family uh, really liked this because it was quite practical mm. and she could do some small things and still feel like she was doing something. 
future. And already we're seeing that it works because it's speaking to your sense of who you are. You're somebody who wants to do something to feel that you can do something practical. You mentioned the word practical, so you're somebody who identifies as being practical. Again and again, we're seeing that there's a match between the message which works and how people see their identity, such as they see a connection. Um, who didn't like it? Yeah, a Formula One driver, I think. Yeah. <laughs> who didn't like the bit about us personally and we to use less energy and such like, we'd rather just pay for a forest or something and actually flying around and driving our car. Okay, yeah. A 17-year-old lad, phone, will I be able to charge my phone? <laughs> Using less energy, I want them to charge. <laughs> <laughs> we get you a little solar panel. Um, um, please, uh, again, anybody I haven't heard from yet? Would like to say anything on this? I'm completely skeptical about it all, so it's it's irrelevant. Let me pull out some of the messages in there. There's a bunch there. These are very familiar messages. Do, this is all about energy saving. Now, for those of you who are working here in university for low carbon, uh, low carbon university, this is all very relevant and important. Here's a an advert to wet your whistle. The energy we waste in Wales produces tons of CO2. Might well be leave the TV on standby. Overfill a kettle. Or leave a tap running. But we can all do something about it. And save money on our energy bills too. To work out the size of your carbon footprint and for tips on how to reduce it, visit walescarbonfootprint.gov.uk. Okay, we're not even going to discuss that. Everything was wrong with that. Um, the number one lesson being, don't give it to an advertising agency. So, um, water consumption whilst you brush your teeth is not a major impact. Um, in fact, actually, this is a big problem with all of these campaigns. They're, they're based on the idea that everybody can do a few easy steps, right? Easy steps, really tricky. Unplugging your mobile phone charger, irrelevant. The amount of difference it makes to your, to your, your energy use is so tiny as to be virtually unmeasurable. So why take people's precious attention for something which is pointless? And there was a lot of this going around, especially about 10 years ago when there was a big fashion for this kind of thing at the moment. Uh, now, the problem is, what happens is that people transfer behavior in one department to another department. We see this all the time with plastic bags. People are very good with their plastic bags, they've completely got the message now. And then in, when we talk in focus groups, they present themselves as being environmental because they are recycling their <coughs> plastic bags, which was actually a very small part of their overall impact anyway. This was possibly one of the craziest and most egregious ones. When Tesco's, when Tesco's ran a campaign where if you bought low energy light bulbs, you could win air miles. <laughs> was so bad that actually it got pulled pretty fast, right? But it's great. And this is typical for what we do. Now you said how we can learn from other things. It's called moral licensing, where you transfer your moral behavior in one place to another. And it is completely outside the bounds of proportionality. So um, in the area of diet, for example, you can go to any uh, you know, Burger King or whatever here in, here in Sheffield, and you'll see somebody who's getting a double bacon cheeseburger and a giant-sized um, diet coat. A giant, and you say, why are you getting a giant size? And they say, because it's a double bacon cheeseburger. Like in people's minds, the two things are completely connected, right? Of course you get the giant size because that's the giant offset for the, the bad thing. So there's a lot of this in dietary behaviours. People are having a little bit of salad to go with their chips or whatever, right? Um, so, which might explain mushy peas because it's hard to understand. Uh, so we know this, and we know this in focus groups, we know that people, so we've got to be very wary of this when we give people behaviours to do, just to flag up for you. Behaviours have to be meaningful and worthwhile and not transferable. Um, there's a lot of research on this. I can't even tell you the whole thing, but I have to say you have to recognise behaviour is very complex. Right? It is not a simple thing about just doing a bit, here's a simple thing you can do, because people move that around on their, on their kind of, you know, their, their 
the scrabble board of behaviours. So, so um, any communications around behaviour has to reflect complexity. Right? Money, doing a little bit to save money, that seems like a good idea. We heard a little bit from people, it seems to work. We have to be careful with money messaging because as we've already heard Lloyd's bank knows, Making or saving money is never people's main motivator. Many might say, well, what about people who don't have much money? I go, it's still not their main motivator. The reason that money is important for them is what they do with it. Mm -hmm. The reason why for a teenage mum money is so important is because it's part and parcel of her doing a good job caring for her kids. That's why money is important. That's the value, not the money. Why does the head of Barclays Bank need to be paid a million pounds a year? And why is he so concerned that another bank is getting, being paid one and a half million pounds a year because the money is the measure of his status within his field and the recognition he has for his skills. And having lots of money is nice, but actually there's plenty of research to show that it doesn't motivate people. It's the relative amounts of money. So the thing we know with this is that money is always a proxy, that's to say a stand-in for other values, right? Caring or security or recognition or status or freedom. So. Freedom to do things, right? So when we talk about money, we need to speak to those values. This is very important when it comes to energy saving. Oh, now here's another example. Voted the most successful advertising campaign of all time. MasterCard ran these adverts here. You can't see it, but it says here, Little Pine, $25. Garden Shovel, $12. Growing your own family tree, priceless. Right? It's not the money, it's the value, and it's what you do with the money. And as we know, this all gets a little bit, as we were hearing before, this gets a bit icky. But it's long been there in the advertising agency. So how do you speak to people who are completely motivated by money? How would we speak to, to our, our colleague here in the, in the uh, energy, you know, in the, in the steel industry and so on? Well, we appeal to other values, recognising that money isn't the only one. This advert here appeared above the New York Stock Exchange. Help China reduce its reliance on coal-fired heating plants prevent 60 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions. It's never been done before. In other words, words, the value, value which it's speaking to, consider it sold, is the challenge of taking something on and doing a great job doing something that no one's done before. I found that very interesting. So many people think the only way we can talk to, to big business or finances in terms of how much money they can make, actually have done a lot of work with them. Yes, money is important as a measure of success, professionalism, moving forward and growth. For those right. Let's, Let's have, have a little bit of fun thing with your values. We're doing all right. We're at half seven. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop in 25 minutes. Are we all right so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So here's an interesting case study. Have a look at this and see. You remember how I said right at the beginning? I said good communications speaks to validates who people are. Says what you are is great. What you are is important. And when you do this thing, the world becomes more the way you want it to be. So this was interesting. This was an advert which was run in the southern United States and also in churches to start a conversation with conservative evangelicals. The most challenging climate audience there is, actually. Maybe that Rotary Club. I worked in Rotary Club. They're challenging too. So for conservative evangelicals, we know there's a very high level of skepticism there. And these are some of their values. So this advert was put out by them, produced by the Christian Evangelical Evangelical Environment Coalition in order to speak to people like themselves. So already it's being done by people to speak to the values of people like themselves. God saw that it was good, and Jesus says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Yet too many of the cars, trucks, and SUVs that are made that we choose to drive are polluting our air, increasing global warming, changing the weather, and endangering our health, especially the health of our children. So if we love our neighbor and we cherish God's creation, maybe we should ask, what would Jesus try? <laughs> <laughs> okay, as communicators, as communicators, what can we learn from that? Anybody want to suggest? Well, it raises the question they ask themselves. Mm. Oh Lord, what would you do? What would Jesus do? This is a central, this is a central question for evangelicals. Mm. And therefore it puts out, it's, it's a little funny, they know it's a joke, but it's putting it in the right framework. 
Well, I was just going to say, it's using their own, their yeah. own framework. Their own, their own exactly. Yeah. Other thoughts? So I can't hear that. It, he's just basically repeating the same thing. He's it, it, saying it's in their, it's their, their own language and their own terms. Yeah, please. I think it's just a very good circular narrative. So if I were a conservative Christian in the southern US, if I was watching that, I'd probably think, oh, great Jesus. And then it goes off in the middle, it goes back into all oh, these liberal, carbon, future, changey things. And then <coughs> it then goes back with the what, does Je- what would Jesus do? So it gets you right back to the sort of connecting religion, connecting Jesus to it, so it ends with a point that's important to them and starts with a point that's important to them as well. Remember, it starts with a validation. (laughs) God saw that it was good, and Jesus says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Right, bang! This is what you believe in, this is what's important. I'm talking to you, and also very important for evangelicals who, for whom scripture is absolutely central to their belief. So, Starting with the Bible is the beginning of the conversation, then the question on the basis of biblical truth, what would Jesus do? Now, it doesn't work for people who are not in that audience. But I don't think it puts them off. I don't think if you were, a, if you were like a, you know, a left-wing atheist looking at that, you go, oh, well, I don't believe in climate change then. So I think it's fine. I think it's a way of engaging new audiences. How well does it really work for that audience? Because yeah. those people... Yep. so plainly do not love their neighbour as themselves, in so many ways. <laughs> Whoa, well, that's going to be... Well, I'm asking, has that been looked into? How well has it, well, how well has it worked for them? Yeah. It has not transformed evangelicals. I mean, it's not suddenly because it's one small advert, it's a drop in a big, big sea. It has started good conversations, the evangelical environment network is still moving, uh, it's, still, it's still doing it. I think, I think you can have good communications, which doesn't, you know, it's like a shot in the war. It doesn't win the war. Um, how well it works? Well, no, it's true. It has not been tested. And that's an important challenge. But I think it meets the criteria of what we know in other tested situations would work. Yeah? And then your judgment of what they think, in a way, doesn't matter. Because it's very, very important in communications to reflect to people what they think, not what the outside world thinks. Yeah? People always have an opinion of themselves which is positive. And therefore, in communications, it's important to reflect that. Now, if you don't feel happy doing that, no one's asking you to do it. Right? Nobody is asking you to engage with people who you don't like or you don't want to be positive with. But somebody needs to. That's my point. Right? And we don't, want to validate, we don't want to validate values what we think are wrong or bad. That's important. It's not like if we were dealing with a racist to say, yeah, you're a racist, that's great. That's great, I'm a racist too, and you know what? Racists want to take action on climate change because we could be swamped by immigrants. We don't want that message, so we don't need to promote it. It's not like every single message which works for every audience is okay. But we need to recognize a match. Let me push on. Let's talk about something different, preventing litter. This is a classic example. This will be shown on any marketing uh, lecture. Um, So it's an interesting one. It's a behavior. It's a relatively simple behavior, dropping litter. It's based on values, like the people who are dropping litter. We know demographically young men who don't care very much about the place they live. Right? They're anti-authority. They've probably their whole lives been told off by teachers, um, by their parents. They're aware of the peer pressure, which is what this first advert tries to work to. But the question is, who is putting on the pressure? So Keep Britain Tidy ran this campaign back in 2007. Um, and the question is, as communications goes, is that good or not good? Is it effective or not effective? What do we do? We'd like to share. Ineffective, but ineffective why? Because it's, it's degrading the, the person. Yeah, it's definitely not saying this is who you are and it's worthwhile. Definitely not saying that, please. It might work for someone uh, who doesn't want to look like that. Like, it might do, although weirdly, when you go to the website, which I think they've now closed down, you can actually take a selfie and then stick a snout on it. Which <laughs> <laughs> is kind of cool. <coughs> it's it's, it's generalising. I mean, he's got a hoodie on and he's young. And, I mean, this is yeah. it's taking a it type, isn't it? Yeah, it's generalising, it's stigmatising. Look, it doesn't work, anyway. Yeah. We, we, we don't think it works, and we know it doesn't work. Um, the... Um, the other thing, which is I, the important thing on this, which is a very important lesson for organisations, is 
Who is the primary audience for this? Who is this really, who is this advert really for? The people the advert. The people, well, go deeper than that. The people who commission the advert? The people yeah. who complain about litter bugs. People who complain? It's people who <coughs> badly of your yeah, we can even go further than that. Yes, it's true. It's it's for the people. It's for the. It's not for the people who drop the litter. It's the people who hate the litter. But I think we can go a step further. We say it's for the members of Keep Britain Tidy. So a classic thing that campaign organisations do is put out adverts for their members, even when they're trying to speak to somebody else, mm. which is understandable because they're membership organisations, right? We don't want to chastise them for like trying to speak to their members, but we need to recognise it's hard to speak to people who aren't your members when you're always keeping an eye to. Pleasing, helping your, you know, pleasing your members. Right. This, however, is a classic success story. Don't mess with Texas. Been running for 20 years, actually 25 years now. Um, and don't mess with Texas. So successful, actually. But I showed this in, uh, I showed this in the states, and people said, "Oh, I didn't know that was a litter campaign," because the phrase has become so strong that it actually started as an anti-litter campaign. And it works because don't mess with Texas so perfectly epitomizes the values of people. It's basically saying, hey, you're Texan, that's cool. Yeah? If you are Texan, dropping litter is a really un-Texan thing to do. Look at this advert. I wouldn't do it. 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 Yeah, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it either. I wouldn't do it. I'd never do it. Don't mess with Texas. Is that great? It doesn't even tell you what not to do. It's entirely, it's not even saying don't you do it, because that wouldn't be Texan, right? Because you have a personal freedom to do whatever you want on your property. But hey, I wouldn't do it. It's creating a peer mechanism, right? A lot we can learn from that. So, if good communication speaks well to values, bad communications don't. It does the whole thing in reverse, right? It says it projects onto people what they are not. It shows them people who are not like them, and it says, "Hey, be like us." That is a big part of failed environmental communications. Yeah. Hey, we're the Greens. We know that you're not, but we're the Greens. So come and join our club because it's great over here. And be more like us. Don't be like you. Be like us. And it doesn't work well. I'm afraid we have to be very, very wary of this because people. People define themselves by who they are. <laughs> I know it's and, and who they are not. And the in-group, out-group thing is very important. People define, I'll repeat it. People define themselves by who I am. I'm this kind of person, but who they are not. I am not that kind of person. So read your Jeremy Clarkson carefully. He plays this game very well. I'm this kind of person. I am not that kind of person, which is actually us. Right. He, Jeremy Clarkson and people who love Jeremy Clarkson, who are very <coughs> funny and entertaining, defines himself as not being like me. That's powerful. So it means we have to be wary for many people of environmentalist messaging. That doesn't mean environmental messaging, it means environmentalist messaging. So I'd say for general people who are not of the core, things which speak of environmentalist including things which say save, stop, defend, protect, no. Um, no, I'm making my son an environmentalist. Um, no, I'm not doing it. Um, green, eco, these things we need to be careful with. In language terms, we call these frames. These are frames which contain values, and people use them as a mark of identity. Interestingly, I'm not going to talk much about it, but language-wise, always use to people the language they use for themselves. Yeah. So just now, working around these workshops I'm giving here, I'm writing a, uh, a report for a big aid agency on how to speak to financiers about renewable energy. And one of the things we're looking at is how they talk about themselves. So we just say, interview them, just say, what makes you proud of your work? What's important about what you do? What do you care about? The words they use to describe what makes them proud of who they are, what they do, are the words with which to talk to them about climate change. Yeah? Those words, not my words, their words. So always, you can do this as a piece of work, but you can also do this just when you meet people. Listen to the words that they use. 
And also, by the way, might I say, listen to people all the time. So, like, everything is an excuse to learn. Sometimes you want to argue with people, but often learn. So I was on, I was just doing a piece of work in Canada. I was sitting on a large part of my flight with a, with a guy who was in the US Air Force and a strong Trump supporter. I thought, great. This is great. This is my little one-on-one -on -one focus group here. And so I didn't get into a big argument with him about Trump or what I thought about Trump. I said, tell me, tell me, like, why, do you, why do you think Trump's good? Tell me about it. You know, I, I respected his views. I made it clear I didn't agree with him, by the way. It wasn't like making him feel okay about it. But and when he said something I strongly disagreed with, rather than saying that's ridiculous, I'd say, tell me why. I was to dig down and understand. So do spend your time listening and talking to people. And then understand their language so you can use it. Avoid green speak. Right. Climate silence. So I've just said that example about starting conversations with people. Try and do this as part of your activism because two thirds of people can't remember have ever having had a conversation with anybody about climate change. <laughs> That's pretty bad. We've got a whole report on, here on climate silence. Um, and it's a silence. It's not, like a, it's not like people not talking about climate change. It's people deliberately not talking about it. Hands up everybody here who's had a situation where you've maybe tried to talk about climate change with somebody, maybe a friend or a family, and the conversation has suddenly gone somewhere else. And, and yeah, so like, exactly. Like, what happens to that conversation? And it just dies, or it changes the subject, or it goes somewhere else, right? That's a silence. That's a socially constructed silence, is when people cannot even engage with a conversation. We have to challenge it, and that has to be a big part of our action. And we have to, a primary objective has to be starting a wider conversation. We've talked a little bit already about authentic messengers. Right? Keeping an eye on the time now, we've got another 15 minutes, so I'll speak even faster. Authentic messages. We've heard that people will trust messages when they come from somebody who is like them. Yeah? This is really important. Messengers are, I think, more important than the message. So part of the issue on this is like, hey, I'm a, I'd say, a, like a left-wing environmentalist. I don't want to start getting into conversation with, like, you know, with conservative UKIP supporters. Fine. Don't do it then. No one's asking you to do that. You probably wouldn't have authenticity. But it would be good if somebody was to have that conversation there. Finding the right messenger for the right audience, I think, is really, really important. And that means sometimes, actually, communications isn't about the content of the communications. It's the process by which we encourage and enable people to speak. So, for example, with my work with faith groups, it's about finding people of different faiths who can go and speak in their church or go and speak in their workplace. Or similarly, work for trades unionists, finding trades unionists who can go and speak within their, within their, um, you know, their, local, uh, their local meeting, shop stewards or whatever. So finding that process for messengers. And I especially like unusual messengers. Maybe the Pope's not so unusual. This guy here in the middle is pretty unusual. He's a, a, actually become a friend of mine, strangely. He's a former Republican congressman for North Carolina, very conservative man, um, very conservative in his values, passionate about climate change. Um, I'm interested in people like that who break, who break the mold and who speak outside their category. So I think we need, I think we need new voices. I think we need to actively find them, and finding, recruiting, and supporting new voices is probably more important than being the voice ourselves. Actually, um, I'm not going to have time for Sabbath. Um, authenticity. We've talked a little bit about authenticity. I think it's so important. I mean, it's way more important than it ever was before. The reason people really are not going to trust that bedtime stories advert we watched, or generally speaking adverts or all of things, they just simply don't trust that the people talking to them are real people. We, part of the, part of, unquestionably part of the appeal of Jeremy Corbyn, and I'm afraid, in truth, part of the appeal of Donald Trump is that they are genuinely who they seem to be. <laughs> yeah? And I don't think anyone would deny that for Iron. They are what they are. You can see what they are, and they have authenticity for wherever, for every, wherever you sit on them. <laughs> sit on them. So <laughs> let's look at that authenticity for a moment. Here's two recent things. I've just been in Alberta. Alberta's very, very divided. Try and see if we can find language that brings people together. Starting, of course, 
Alberta is in Canada. Alberta, for anyone who doesn't know, has the dirtiest oil industry in the world. Of course, if I say that to Albertans, they go, wow, have you seen Venezuela? And I go, right, okay, well, everybody can always find something worse, but they're pretty bad. They're not even digging out normal oil, they're digging out oil sands, which is this kind of gluey bitumen goop where you need huge amounts of energy to extract the oil and they're devastating hundreds of thousands of square kilometers of land to do it. Awful. It's a very polarized situation. We're trying to find language which is about, oh, I'm proud of Alberta, this is who we are in Alberta, and we can move forward and we can change, and I've worked validating who they are. So here's two recent examples. One authentic, one inauthentic. This is what the government of Alberta has just put out. It's called the Climate Leadership Policy. <laughs> And it's trying to say, hey, I'm up for it. Come on. The province we live in today is not the province we will leave behind. It will be an even better place, making today a proud day, a new day. Introducing Alberta's Climate Leadership Plan. It's got my attention. This action plan on climate change will protect our environment and our health, securing our position as energy leaders. The world will know we care. I care. As we phase out coal pollution and transition to cleaner sources of electricity, our air will become cleaner. Better air quality means healthier Albertans, healthier children, healthier seniors. I never thought I'd see it today. Together, we will innovate for a greener Alberta. This is my passion. Efficiency programs will help industry and individuals contribute in their own ways. You can count me in. Okay. Do you see a problem with that? of which there are many. One is that they hired an advertising agency, or that one bad. Secondly, they got a lot of actors repeating the script, but thirdly, they just threw a lot of words into the script that they thought worked, yeah? So they think that clean works, people like healthy. They think children works, so they threw that in. Yeah? I'm up for it, they think it's our personal quality. But the entire thing is completely inauthentic. Mm. It's awful, actually. And, um, it's not going to persuade anybody. It absolutely doesn't work. Remember, this is a severely divided society, especially polarised between left and right. This is a left-wing government who produces, and there's a right-wing opposition who are trying to bring them down on their climate change policy. Now watch this. This is interesting. This is a very different approach, which is produced by oil sands workers trying to get the shift towards renewables. They're called Iron and Earth, and I love these guys. They're communicating to other workers and wider communities the opportunities of low-carbon energy. We are Iron and Earth, oil sands workers for renewable energy. My name's Liam, and I'm an oil sands worker myself. A fourth generation boiler maker, I grew up on the BC coast and am passionate about protecting our environment. Hey, so I've tried to find work in renewable energy, but year after year, the only jobs available to me are in the oil and gas sector. While leading industrial nations like China, America, and Germany are creating millions of green jobs, Canada just seems stuck on one idea, the fossil fuel economy. I think that needs to change, and I'm not alone. Many of my fellow oil sands workers are starting to think this way. People like Randall Benson, who has built a successful solar company creating jobs through training and installation. There are 175 watts at standard test condition, which is 2020. I have to make a plan for me to be in this new renewable energy field. We are skilled workers, electricians, iron workers, pipe fitters, boiler makers, carpenters, and many more trades. And we could easily transfer our knowledge to the green economy. Well, what, what better way to inform the other side than to come from the workers already inside and ask them what they think? Like, I'm out here making a living and I, I, I enjoy it, but I still see a need for renewable energy. A lot of them are really conflicted, myself being one of them. I think a lot of people would want to make that shift, actually. So do you see how interesting that is? Yeah. That's good communications. Mm -hmm. And so if we're doing stuff here in Sheffield, again, or, or anywhere, it should start with having real people, you can see who they are, they're using their own words, they're talking about their pride in who they are, 
Remember, this is a this is a, a province where a string of high profile celebrities, particularly Leonardo DiCaprio, really burnt some bridges up there, have gone in from outside with this elite narrative of saying what you're doing is filthy. And what happens is people just close ranks. It doesn't shift anything, it actually makes them it, they move back into the joy of belonging and identity, which is based in not listening. And so this works. So again, we can find new ways of talking, right? Let me just see. I can say a few things about engaging people with conservative values. This has been a big part of my work. We are, as far as I'm aware, the only organization in, um, in Europe asking this question, how do we engage with conservatives? Why? Because the single... The single greatest predictor of your attitude on climate change is in politics. Far more, far more than gender, far more than age, far more than way more than education. Left-wing people are massively more likely to think that climate change is real under threat than conservatives, and we have to deal with that. We have to find ways for people with conservative values to engage more effectively. This is essential for building effective public engagement, and my. Dear friends across the environmental movement have really missed a trick on this. For 20 years, 25 years, we've been talking to people like ourselves of left wing values and ignoring the fact that there are large numbers of decent, honorable, concerned, environmentally minded people who don't, who haven't had a different set of political values, who we are actively alienating because, you know, we are the Batman and they're the Spider Man and we're pushing them away. So, environmentalists don't have to do it, but someone has to. And I think it's very important that we find new communicators who can speak to that role. Because that's why that's the role that Nigel Lawson moves into. It's the absence of engagement of conservatives. It's exactly the space he moves into. And that's why part of the problem we have. So one of the things we did at the UK Climate Coalition, for example, is we went in for the first ever time, we tested their communications with conservatives as well as environmentalists. And one of the upshots of that was for the love of this campaign, where people talk about what they love, what they care about, as the biggest issue for climate change. I love nature, I love old factories, I love my children. It's okay to talk about your children if they're your children, right? Um, I love birds, I love parrots. It's performed very well. They've been running it for years now on the basis of the fact it crosses political boundaries. In Canada, we tested language across political boundaries, around carbon tax, actually. And we found the language which worked best with the centre-right was fairness. Interesting, it wasn't about, it wasn't about uh, making money, and it wasn't about, it was about fairness, but having a carbon tax, it says cap and trade here, but it's carbon tax, is a fair way to do it because it rewards the people who do the good stuff and it punishes the ones who do the bad, which is a very conservative value. People who do the right thing should be supported and rewarded and recognised, and people who do the bad thing should be held back and punished. So, fairness works. So all I'm saying is language needs to work across the board, needs to work with conservatives. Faith works, we've done a bunch of work with faith. I'm just showing you again a practical application of this is who you are, what you are is worthwhile, and this is what cares, matters to you. So, um, and interestingly, the language which came out top was the world is a gift. Why hadn't expected that? It's a gift. It's given to you by your creator. Of course, some faiths don't have a creator. So it's given to you by the divine. It's given to you by your gods. It's given to you by whatever. These were the five major faiths, remember. So Hindus and Buddhists have a different view of the world from the Abrahamic faiths. Um, and the world is out of balance. This balance narrative keeps coming back. You know, we need to put the world back in balance. Seasons are coming at the wrong year. Things are in the wrong place. This is not how things should be. Again, it's very conservative way of thinking, of saying there are these things which are precious and important to us, but need to be restored and replaced and renewed. These re-words, our re-words keep appearing, right? Made strong again. So, trade unionists, of course, again, have a very different narrative. Their narrative is about social justice. <laughs> and interestingly, we've sat out this issue and let it be dominated by middle-class environmentalists. It's a narrative which seems to work across the board of everyone. <laughs> In other words, the sense that people, it's like this issue is so important, you have to be involved with it. Don't complain about the fact you don't like what someone else does when you're not involved with it. So, just again to say, practically, practically, this is what it looks like. Right. And common purpose, 
Again, we have wartime narratives, people coming together across all kinds of divides, working together. Again, not the language of enemies, but the language of, of working together. And how do we find out? Well, we test it. We go and we sit and we go where people are. We sit, we talk, we listen to them, we interview them, both formally, I'm going to interview, informally, me sitting next to a guy on the, on the plane. Both ways it works like that. And you have to test, always test, anything you put out. Test it with the people you know will like it, and test it with people you know who won't, just to see if they really, if you are getting any attention from them or if they totally hate it. If they totally hate it, you might want to think, is this the best thing to do? Um, youth, very, okay, I'm going to skip. Youth, youth very important. <coughs> Again, the same things we hear. Here and now, but there's a real silence, a constructed silence problem with young people. So, I'm going to end with uh, just this, because uh, I'm keeping my own time, and I go in and then you're going to have a little wrap up and I have to run for the train. I'm so sorry, I can't, I can't hang around for beer and stuff. But put the questions up and I'll try and answer them, and you can hear the details of that. I wanted to share with something which always makes me feel a little better, because it, it kind of epitomizes some of the stuff I'm talking about. People are motivated by shared values and identity of joy, belonging. Okay, so they were trying to organize people in Belgium the run-up of the Paris conference. Belgians are very divided as a society. As you might know they're divided into two language groups. They're constantly at each other's throats. They, their government collapsed for like years and you never seem to notice, which makes you wonder what it does. And, and they do, however, have some things in common. One of them is singing, mass singing in public. People get together in public spaces and they laugh to <laughs> sing together. So this was called Sing for the Climate, and they thought, let's, let's, all, let's all get together and sing, right? It's a general public audience where I think it epitomizes this idea of the joy of belonging to something. Like, you look at it and you go, yeah, I want to be a part of you, this looks fun. That's, it's got a few of those greeny things, it's got polar bears and icebergs and stuff I wouldn't have put in. But just look at the positive joyfulness of it, the way that it's inclusive, the togetherness. It doesn't say much, by the way. I mean, it's not intelligent, it doesn't have any graphs, it just says, hey, being a part of this, we can all do something, we can all be a part of it. And it was a viral YouTube, I think it went pretty far, it went pretty wide. It's just fun. Thank you.